Some so we have you. Um, he was also a Fulbright Fellow and so received his PhD from the University of California, California Santa, Santa Barbara. And after becoming a member of the Institute for Advanced Study, he joined the Institute for Advanced Study. Einstein, because 
1916 had developed what is called the general theory of relativity. And he had found that gravitation obeys certain equations. And those equations are such that under the right circumstances, not always, but under the right circumstances, stuff will just uh, expand. So if you have a gas or a cloud or the universe, it will tend to expand. And I said didn't like this at all because he looked out the window, but stuff was not expanding. So he said, well, we have to change the equation. So he put in what's called the model constant just to make this thing static and so this happened. But later on, uh, there are the Freeman and uh, Lemaitre, which happened to be actually a Catholic priest. They worked out these equations in more detail and they found out that these extra terms that Einstein had would not be there. In fact, it was a natural solution of the equations that the universe expanded. And so they told Hubble, oh, well, look, this comes out of Einstein's theory that the universe is expanding. So it was a beautiful, in the end, it turned out to be a beautiful verification of Einstein's grand theory, for which, by the way, we'll celebrate the sentence centenary in about three years, or three years, I should say. 2016. So, after Hubble's observations, then other people looked at it. And said, hey, the guy by the name of George Gamow to said, well, what you can do is, if the universe is expanding, you can run the movie backwards. Right? So, expanding like this, but if you look at the past, of course, you can contract, right? And so, you can do a little bit of an estimate, and you can find that, you know, in 10 million years in the past, and things have to be really dense, that the universe maybe was just a point, something like that. He said, if it's a point, it was really hot. If it's really hot, then maybe there is a remnant of this explosion that they took place at the beginning when the universe was born. And he predicted that there should be some heat around, that you should be able to use uh, you know, some sort of special other device to look for heat. Uh, not, not very hot uh, temperature, close to absolute zero, three degrees above absolute zero. But then you should see this heat of the primordial explosion. And uh, so he kind of introduced this notion of cosmic background radiation. And uh, during a BBC show, it was actually uh, Fred Hoyle, a British uh, astronomer, that introduced the name Big Bang. That's when he called it by the name that we know. It was only 1949, so it was several years after the observations. And uh, so, well, at that time, cosmology and universe expanding and so forth was kind of confused almost with theology, so the subject died for a few years. Until what happened is that uh, some physicists that were working at Bell Labs in New Jersey decided that they wanted to look at certain regions of radio waves to see whether they can transmit data from one antenna to another. And so they built this huge antenna, and they started uh, turning on the thing, and they heard all these strange sounds, this like noise that came from every possible direction. So they thought there's something wrong with the antenna. They tested it, they tested it, and then they found a bird's nest inside, which doesn't help because the bird was creating a lot of noise. So they took the bird's nest out, and they still had the noise, and they kept rotating this antenna on the sound, this, this microwave uh, radiation was coming from every direction. And eventually it talked to some Princeton physicist, Dick in particular, and he told him, look, what you find is just a remnant of the Big Bang. You have found this radiation, which is coming from everywhere, which is the remnant of the original explosion. And so you confirm that this Big Bang is actually a real theory, that is real physics. That was in 1964. And then since then, there have been many uh, experiments, mostly satellite born experiments, to try to work out the details of how this Big Bang happened, when it happened, what it created, how did it get created, what elements came out of the Big Bang, what stayed in the ocean, and so forth. And that's a big subject of research today, both in the astronomy and also in the Arctic physics community. So it is a big thing, this Big Bang in physics today, and, uh, and it has kind of a nice ring to it. So we're going to play the clip and then I'm going to speak. I'll just add one thing. I mean, this was a particle physicist knows all this astronomy. It's fantastic. <laughs> uh, so 
One thing I want to mention there, amazingly, so the story about the antenna that you're hearing about, where these, these couple of observers discovered this background radiation, that was about 50 years ago. And tonight at Harvard, they're actually having a 50 year anniversary of the Big Bang. That's the name of this big meeting that they're having tonight. And one of those guys, one of these radio astronomers who accidentally discovered it, is there tonight and giving a talk on it. Um, and so it's sort of a big event that's happening sort of in the astronaut community right now about the Big Bang, and we're doing it too tonight. So did you plan that? It's all planned. I liked Pluto. <laughs> Ergo, I do not like you. <laughs> I actually didn't do Pluto. That was a vote of the International Astronomical Union. If ifs and buts were candy and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. <laughs> Think about that, Dr. Tyson. <laughs> So, you know, so the point of this is, so the subtext of the science behind this skit is uh, Pluto, right? And so I titled this talk, uh, Who Killed Pluto? So uh, this is the clip here. Now, so just to give you sort of the setup, just the background. In 2006, this, this, at least this thing that I always thought of as a planet, right? So when I was in grade school, all the way through high school, etc., you know, I was taught that there were nine planets. The ninth planet was this planet Pluto. A lot of people, especially as a kid, you know, you kind of like Pluto. It's the little one. It's the farthest away. It's named after a cartoon character. You know, so it's this lovable thing. And in fact, it was discovered not that long ago in the 1930s by an American astronomer named Fred Tommel. So there's a lot of sort of love for this little planet, Pluto. But then in 2006, suddenly in the newspapers, there was this big announcement that astronomers all over the world had demoted Pluto, and it was no longer a planet. And there was this big outcry, this big sadness, you know, great cry went out. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this. So what happened, and who really is responsible for killing Pluto? So as we heard, you know, Sheldon thinks that it's this guy's fault. Who, who's seen this guy before? Who knows Neil deGrasse Tyson? Yeah, so Neil deGrasse Tyson is a fairly well-known astronomer. He's probably the most famous astronomer now that we don't have Carl Sagan anymore. And he, uh, he has played a role in this, uh, a little bit, although I think you know, we can't fully blame Neil for this. So who is Neil deGrasse Tyson? So he is a PhD astronomer. He did research in astronomy for a while. But at some point when he was in his sort of, he had had his PhD, but he wasn't a professor. He was a post, what's called a postdoc. 
but he was a postdoc who was tagged to become a member to, to start working at um, the Hayden Planetarium in New York. And he quickly rose to become the director. He was the youngest director in the history of the Hayden Planetarium. And this is probably the, the most visible um, planetarium astronomy museum in the country, if not the world. So in the year 2000, uh, Tyson actually played a really fundamental role in raising a lot of money for the museum. And they had this giant renovation of their facility to create this modern uh, display. If anyone, I don't know if anyone's ever been, but if you've been to Manhattan, it is a great thing to go to. It's really an amazing facility. Um, and in doing so, they have a planet exhibition. And he makes the unilateral decision that he's no longer going to list Pluto among the planets. So, then you have kids coming in and parents coming in who have learned all about Pluto. They come in and see the display, there's no, there's no Pluto. And there's an uproar. So people are angry with Neil deGrasse Tyson for making this decision. This was actually not an officially sanctioned move by any astronomical like union or anything like that, by some national, international astronomy board. Neil Tyson just decided to do this. He thought it was the right thing to do, and I'll get to why he thought that was the case. And in fact, most professional astronomers didn't care. They thought this was the right thing. Um, but in the face of all of this sort of uproar, he, he didn't care. So Tyson is the kind of, you know, if you read the quote here, that's the kind of guy he is. Like, he, he didn't care that people were upset with him. So why was it that he sort of saw this coming? Well, the thing about Pluto is it's always been weird, okay? First of all, here's the, here's the map of the orbits of the classical planets, okay? They're in these nice circles. Almost all of them are going in almost perfect circles around the sun. And they're also in the same plane as the sun, okay? So we got Mercury, Venus, Earth, uh, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and then all of a sudden, you have this weird cockeyed Pluto thing that's way kind of messed up looking, right? Also, you know, it's little, it's smaller than the moon. So already, you know, it's sort of this strange thing that doesn't quite fit in with the rest. You know, something's not quite like the other. Also, its orbit passed through another body of objects in the outer solar system called the Kuiper Kuiper Belt, that over time we started discovering more and more of these little, almost rocky-like things, big rocks orbiting way out there. And it began to look like, hey, you know, Pluto isn't a planet. It's a lot more like some of these other big rocky things that we're discovering out there. And over time, up through the year about 2000, several more of these big rocky things that had cockeyed orbits had been discovered. And so people like Neil deGrasse Tyson, who sort of knew something about what was going on in the field, recognized that it was about, you know, at some point, someone's going to make a legitimate decision and say, hey, you know, we can't keep naming all of these things planets because we're going to have 100 planets. So at some point, you have to draw the line. So who killed Pluto? So there, this is this is someone who actually admits, sort of, has walked into the police off, you know, police station and said, "Okay, I did it. I killed Pluto." He wrote a book about it. This guy named Mike Brown. He's a professor at Caltech. Um, he is just obsessed with finding big rocks in the outer solar system. This guy lives for this stuff. Uh, he loves it. Um, and in 2003, he and his team discovered this thing that he called Xena. Its official name is Eris. Uh, that's bigger than Pluto. And so he knew at that time, as soon as this thing is discovered, you knew something's got to give. Because now, either this is a planet, he either discovered the tenth planet, or he's just killed Pluto. And at the end of the day, what eventually happens is Pluto gets demoted. Um, like I said, he called it Xena after the warrior princess. Who, does anyone who remembers that show? I just wonder. Okay, good. I thought I might be really too old here. Uh, so he calls it Xena, and but the National Astronomical Society or the International Astronomy Union says, no, we're not going to let you call it Xena. They call it Eris, which is a mythical god of goddess of uh, chaos, actually. So that's actually given the chaos that uh, happened after he discovered this thing in Pluto. That's reasonable, I guess. So um, here's the orbit of Eris. And you see it's also kind of messed up like Pluto. It's not this kind of nice round or nice circular orbit in a plane. It's also kind of cockeyed. It's a little bit, it goes out a little bit farther than Pluto, but it is bigger than Pluto. So now what's happened is um, we now have classified the planets in the solar system under two classes. One is just called a planet, okay? And we have eight of those. 
In addition to that, we have another six what are called now dwarf planets. Pluto, Pluto has been demoted to something called a dwarf planet, Eris is a dwarf planet, and all these other little things that are called dwarf planets. So here they are, these are all to scale and size relative to the sun. Okay, so you see Earth is about 100 times smaller than the sun, and Saturn is about, I mean, and Jupiter is about 10 times smaller than the sun. Uh, Pluto is this teeny tiny little thing that's maybe about, uh, oh, it's a third, let's see, it's smaller than a fourth the size of the Earth, something about that size. So who killed Pluto? The final decision actually happened uh, at this meeting in Prague in 2006, where a bunch of astronomers, basically a room like this, about probably 10 times as big as this, there were a bunch of professional astronomers in the room, and there was this discussion that was led by astronomer Joyce and Bell to go through all the evidence we had and try to come up with a new definition for planet and demote Pluto. One of the people in the room is Professor Aaron Barth. Aaron Barth is a professor at UC Irvine, and the way the game works is if you wanted to demote Pluto and say it's a dwarf planet, you have these yellow cards. Everybody was handed a yellow card, and you hold up your yellow card if you count, if you say kill Pluto. Okay, and there it is, proudly killing Pluto. <laughs> he saved a card. I went to his office yesterday. He's got it on his phone <coughs> board. He pulled it out and, you know, proudly showed it to me. So there he is, killing Pluto. Another role that UCI astronomer played, I don't even know if you know about this, here's the person who counted the votes, okay? Uh, Virginia Trimble is another professor at UC Irvine. She was there at the meeting. She was in charge of counting the votes. She had the last chance. She could have saved Pluto if she just would have fudged the count. But she didn't fudge the count. You know, she did the honest thing and, she, and killed Pluto. So I'll end it there and we'll watch another clip. Unless anyone has any questions. Yeah. It was overwhelming. It was like, I don't remember, it was like 550 to 50 or something. It was just overwhelming. I mean, it's. What the, actually, let me say one thing really quickly about the Pluto thing, too, because I was sort of joking around about it. The nice thing about this, right, and it's actually a very good thing this decision was made, because it, it tells you something about the progression of science, right? You have preconceived ideas about what you think is right. And then as time goes by, you observe more and more and new things. And eventually, it became overwhelming that there were all these other kind of funky rocks out there that were sort of like Pluto. The other thing, that this fundamental thing that these dwarf planets don't do is they don't clear out their own orbit. That is, all the other planets, there's no rocks near, there's no other smaller rocks near their orbit. They're so big, they kick them away. These dwarf planets are massive enough that gravity makes them basically spheres, but they're not massive enough that they just plow out all the stuff around them. Okay, but this is just an example of you have an idea, but in the face of new data, you change your idea, you change your sort of picture of what the universe is like, and then you move forward from there. And so this revolution with Pluto, I mean, it's kind of fun, but it's just an example of, I think, one of the strengths of science that you have preconceived ideas and you change your ideas in the face of data, just like you were hearing about the Big Bang, where a lot of people thought this idea that the universe was expanding was crazy, but in the face of more and more direct evidence, people began to change their ideas. It's not because they wanted to have a big bang or they wanted to make the universe expand. It was because there was so much data that eventually you just had to take it. You had to accept it. Still the time for joking. <laughs> serious research which requires complete and utter focus. All right. That's Buckle Double and Book.
Somehow I managed, I imagine that this is what my theoretical part of the physicist colleagues who are here actually do when they're working on the research. I mostly type, write code, but these guys I think mostly think. <laughs> Just probably better. Right? So okay, so what's all this? So I don't even know if you noticed this, but in this clip, they're talking about dark matter. So what they're doing, you'll set up the clip if you remember it. They have this equation on the board, and they're, the setup is we're trying to figure out a way to detect dark matter particles in space. That's the setup. So what are they talking about, and what is this dark matter? So my slides are a little older. Let me start here. Actually, let me back up about a slide. So the story with dark matter, I, a lot of these things, right, there's actually tie-ins for a lot of these subjects actually in Southern California. And the story with dark matter is no different. So the first observational evidence that something funky was going on, what is dark matter, right? So, so dark matter is a substance that we think exists in huge quantities in the universe. And in fact, outweighs, there's more dark matter by mass than normal stuff like the stuff that I'm made of, you made of, all the stuff in this room is made of, by about a factor of six. So there's six times more of that stuff in the universe than there is normal stuff. And the story as to why we believe it and what it is is an interesting one. And it begins in Southern California, like I say, with a with an interesting character by the name of Fritz Zwicky. So Zwicky was a professor at Caltech, and uh, he was a very kind of interesting character, I would say. He was studying uh, galaxy clusters. Specifically, he was looking at a big cluster of galaxies, so basically individual galaxies that are all orbiting around each other. And he noticed that they were moving around each other really fast. And he calculated how much mass needed to be there in order to keep these things whizzing around each other that fast. And he found out that the number was something like 100 times bigger than the mass he could account for in the stars of those galaxies. And he said, look, there's got to be more mass there, but we can't see it. I'm going to call it dark matter. This was about 1933. Most people thought this guy was crazy. He was sort of eclectic anyway. Um, and th the story was dropped for a while. To give you an example of why people thought this guy was crazy, like a bit of his personality, I, I wanted to grab a picture of it, but I didn't have time to do it. There's a very famous picture of him where he's just kind of going like this. Okay. He's going like this because he would often do this to people and call them a name. He would call them a spherical bastard. <laughs> and so what does that mean? What does he mean by spherical bastard? So spherical, what's special about spheres? They're the same no matter which direction you look at them. Okay? So if you're a spherical bastard, that means you're a bastard no matter which direction people are looking at. <laughs> so that's Fritz Wicke. He says there's dark matter out there. People think Fritz is crazy and sort of story goes on. But when people really started to take this idea seriously was in the 1960s. Astronomers like Vera Rubin were using a new, a new technology that had been invented to allow people to really study how fast galaxies were spinning using telescopes and using um, analyzing the spectra of galaxies, of the light coming from galaxies. And what she wanted to do was figure out how fast the things are spinning around. Now what she expected to see Okay, is that if you, if you look at how fast the galaxy is spinning from the inside out, you expect the thing to be spinning fast in the inner part and be slow, slowly spinning in the outer part. And just, just because there's more mass in the middle, so the gravitational tug is higher, so stuff will be going faster, and as you go out, stuff is, goes more slowly. The same thing is seen in the solar system. The Earth is going around the sun much more quickly than old Pluto out there. It's actually going around pretty slowly. So she was expecting to see this kind of shape in the rotation speed of galaxies as you go out. But what she found was something more like this. It was almost as if as you go out, there's more and more stuff out there that you couldn't see. The only way to explain this is if you, if you have to have it. Well, one, the way that it's become common to explain this is that there's, as you go out farther and farther from the galaxy, there's more and more unseen stuff. So there's stuff out there that, again, we're going to stick with the name dark matter that's surrounding the galaxy in much the same way that Fritz Zwicky wanted there to be this additional mass out there surrounding all throughout galaxy clusters. So starting then in, about in the 1960s, this idea that this dark matter might be there became sort of a more realistic idea. 
and more and more evidence has piled up since then. I don't have time to go into it, but lots and lots and lots of additional evidence has gone into constructing a picture where there's dark matter out there. Now, I wanted to real quickly say that, in fact, the universe is even weirder than that. If you go up and you add up all of the stuff in the universe, all of the mass energy in the universe, um, we think that there's a pie chart that looks something like this. Only 5% of the matter in the universe is normal stuff. Okay, So that's any atom you've ever heard of. Anything in the periodic table, anything that's made this floor or air or gas or anything is only 5%. 25% of the stuff in the universe is this dark matter that I've been talking about. And then another 70% is something that's even weirder than that that we call dark energy. Okay, Just because we've given it a name doesn't mean we know what it is. Uh, but there's some other stuff out there that's, that this stuff is actually driving the universe not just to expand, but to accelerate and how fast it's expanding. So a big question right now in physics, one of the biggest questions in physics and astronomy right now is to figure out what is exactly going on in these wedges. We have a lot of evidence that there's missing mass out there, but we don't know what the heck this stuff is. And so what we'd like to do is detect it. One of the places where people want to detect it is with um, observations of gamma rays. And this is what the, this is what they were talking about in the clip that we just heard. So the idea is that you have you have a galaxy like our galaxy, the Milky Way, that we're living in, okay, that's sitting there. And around each of these galaxies, we think, exists little blobs of dark matter. And this is sort of theoretically motivated, there's, and also observationally motivated, you think that there's all this additional mass around there. And in one of the leading theories, or leading ideas for what this dark matter is, is that it's made up of particles, but it's particles that are different than the kinds of particles that we're used to dealing with. But there's a chance that these particles, if they're crammed really, really close together, they can, they can, they can annihilate with each other, and in that process, eventually spit out high energy gamma rays. So the picture is that there might be this going on. And if this were actually detected, it would be a huge deal, right? Because you'd be detecting, you know, more, you'd be detecting the fundamental constituents of the universe that make up more of the universe than anything else we know about. Um, and so the ex we, we're sort of looking for that. There's there's telescopes like this this NASA satellite called Fermi and other telescopes that are looking for this kind of thing. And we have professors at UCI that are fundamentally involved in this search. Um, two of them are my colleagues on my floor, uh, Kev Abazajan and Manoj Kapagan actually put a paper out last year where they actually thought they may have seen something, which is sort of what you would expect to see if there really was this dark matter being annihilated in the center of the galaxy. You know, it could be that something like that is going on. We need to wait and see whether or not that's true. But I wanted to leave you with just one point. And if you run into a provost or any of your deans or any of sort of the big wigs on campus, maybe you can pass this message along to them. Um, in the physics department, we study this whole pie. The whole pie. We're interested in this, and this, and this. Every other department on campus is only in that 5%. Why is the funding not distributed accordingly, right? Why are we not getting 95% of the funding and everybody else getting 5%? I don't understand. I don't think we understand why. So if you could pass that message along, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Professor Philip. Now, you will have Professor Tate come up.
Thank you. Now this track is a wonderful example of how liquids with different specific gravities interact in a cylindrical container. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Raj, what will be? Whatever you recommend. Uh, how about a grasshopper? I mean, a mean grasshopper. Okay, good. Coming up. Sheldon? I'll have a Diet Coke. <laughs> okay, can you please order a cocktail? I need to practice mixing drinks. Fine. I'll have a Virgin Cuba Libre. <laughs> That's um, rum and coke without the rum. Yes. <laughs> so, coke. Yes. <laughs> And would you make it diet? <laughs> There's a can in the fridge. Uh, Cuba Libre traditionally comes in a tall glass with a lime wedge. Then swim to Cuba. <laughs> Bartenders are supposed to have people skills. <laughs> okay. Raj, here you go. All right, who's next? I'd like to try a uh, slippery <laughs> Of almost anything that you can actually drink. 
Uh, so I searched the internet. I had no idea that was true. My brother's a bartender. He probably should have known. Um, I found out, sure enough, Red Carnier has a specific gravity of 1.03, so that means it's just slightly heavier than water. Bailey's Irish Cream is a little heavier, so it goes below it. Um, next. And Curvedent has a much higher specific gravity of 1.12. So if you leave these things long enough, they separate out nicely like this, and you end up with the drink that you want. Now the drink we actually saw on the clip, I think, was probably a tequila sunrise. I have to say, I actually know what that one tastes like, unlike the Irish flag. <laughs> uh, again, <laughs> you can look up a recipe on the internet. This is a really nice looking uh, execution. So it's tequila, orange juice, grenadine syrup, and a nice cake. And again, if we look at the specific gravities, we see that they all work out. The lighter stuff, the tequila, ends up on the top, and then there's the orange juice, followed by the grenadine syrup. And if the specific gravities of things are close, then they mix a little bit. So you end up with sort of this region in the middle here, where it's not quite uh, grenadine and it's not quite orange juice, but you can see that it's sort of a color in between. And of course, the ice cubes float on top. So, um, <laughs> let's see what a tequila flag Irish sunrise would look like. <laughs> By the way, this sounds absolutely disgusting to me, so I'm not really advocating that you try this at all. <laughs> uh, but it's easy to see what it's going to look like because I just found all the specific gravities. So if we put it all together, there you go. Uh, if you make one, take a picture of it. <laughs> so, oh, there's other things you can do with specific gravity. Uh, the one I thought of immediately was you could build a lava lamp. So a lava lamp uh, is oil inside this container, and there's also blobs of wax. And the wax is special because the specific gravity of the wax actually is really sensitive to the temperature. So if you heat it up, the specific gravity gets less, and then when it cools down, it gets more. And there's a heater at the bottom. So the stuff that are closer to, closer to the heater, down at the bottom, they lose specific gravity and they start to rise. The blobs closer to the top cool down and they fall again. And that explains what you see with the lava lamp. So any questions about that? Yeah, so I kind of made fun of specific gravity, and the question is, why don't we just use density? Yeah. I think we should just use density. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. In fact, I think in the units that I would probably use, it would be one. <laughs> I think maybe the reason is because if you divide a density by a density, then you don't have to worry about whether you're measuring things in grams per centimeter or cube or whatever. So that, that might be one argument. Any other questions? Okay, I guess we can go to the next clip. Okay, what's the big surprise? A minute. This tray contains clues as to what you and I are going to be doing on Valentine's Day. Oh, okay, let's see. We've got to have milk chocolate, Swiss cheese, fondue. My lactose intolerant boyfriend is going to eat all this, and I'm going to climb on his back and rock it to the moon. <laughs> no. <laughs> but it does involve air travel. Okay. Uh, let me slice this Swiss cheese with my Swiss army knife, and then you can wash it down with a cup of Swiss Miss Instant Cocoa. Okay, I'm starting to think Swiss is key here. Uh, We're going to Disneyland and ride the Matterhorn. How does that involve air travel? We're going to Disney World and ride the Matterhorn. <laughs> Sweetie, this started out fun, let him over it. <laughs> We're going to Switzerland to see the CERN Super Collider. <laughs> and ski, we'll also go skiing. We're going skiing in Switzerland. Well, you'll ski up all, but we will be in Switzerland for Valentine's Day. Oh my god, Leonard, that's incredible! Not so fast. <laughs> you might want to hold off on lining your right leaf sleep, Denny. Or rhyming what, Lee? Rhyming literally, it means turn up line refers to a traditional land.
planter can carve from a root vegetable and use to celebrate certain Swiss festivals, which you will not be celebrating because A, these festivals occur in the fall. <laughs> and B, you will not be going to Switzerland. Sheldon, <laughs> we've been through this. I'm taking money. Afraid not. Do you recognize this? Not the roommate agreement. <laughs> Indeed, the roommate agreement. I call your attention to the friendship rider in Appendix C, Future Commitments, number 37. In the event one friend is ever invited to visit the Large Hadron Collider, now under construction in Switzerland, he shall invite the other friend to accompany him. <laughs> So now the next thing we're going to do is zoom in a little further and look at one of the experiments that we do at this laboratory. So here you can scale the building, it goes underground. And what this is showing you, so this is the pipe that's coming in on either edge here. Uh, the pipe comes into this underground facility, and you're going to get an idea for how big it is actually in a minute. And when it gets there, when the protons get there, they collide, they release their energy, and then giant detectors that are located in the storing underground are going to measure the reaction and uh, look at what happens when the particles um, collide with each other. And you'll see there's a person in the rest of this that will uh, show you and give you some idea for how big this thing actually is. So there she goes. They don't actually let you do this if you visit them. <laughs> so this thing is basically like the size of a cathedral. I mean, it's, it's enormous. So 
So it's cool. Right? I mean, you can go there. If the accelerator is not running, they'll actually let you go underground and give you a tour. And there's basically two experiments that are about that size. And they're just there to see what happens when protons collide. Um, so now this next little video is going to show us a couple of protons and see what happens when they actually do meet each other and collide. Um, now note, actually, they're going at the speed of light, which you wouldn't be able to see if I just showed it here. So in the video, they're going to go a lot slower. Get the attention. So it starts down here, and you see that they go around a little ring. That speeds them up a little bit. Then when they're fast enough, they go to a bigger one. That makes them faster, again, until they're ready to go into the main ring. And that's where they get all the way up to the energy. And the energy that they're going uh, is something like 99.9999% of the speed of light. So they get whipped up, and then we're finally going to now see them come together uh, and explode. So then we zoomed into the detector that we have. This is now an end of view. You see they explode, they produce all these subatomic particles, and this, this colored stuff that's around it, that represents all that machine, that detector. Uh, and it's, what it's doing is measuring what kinds of particles those are and how much energy they have. All right, so basically, why do you want to do that? Well, that reconstructs this little quantum explosion. In fact, sometimes they call it a mini Big Bang, because the energy released is something that we don't see going on around us in the universe almost anywhere at all anymore. All right, so why do we want to do that? And right, I said it's cool to visit. You can go see what it looks like. It's also actually doing really interesting science. Um, so the reason why we want to accelerate them and try to collide them is to produce new kinds of particles. So Einstein taught us that E equals mc squared. That means that we can convert the high energy of the protons into mass of new kinds of particles. So we can try to produce particles that we don't actually see uh, anymore. Maybe they can create already. Uh, maybe, maybe it's dark matter, actually. So the LHC in particular was designed with the energy it has because we wanted it to be able to produce the Higgs boson. Um, the Higgs boson is a particle that we think should exist in order to give masses to all of the other particles we see. That's actually a whole separate little mini lecture. So you have to find me in my office and ask me about it if you want to know more about that. But once we produce the Higgs boson, it can decay into two photons. And a photon is actually the particle of electromagnetic interaction. So light is actually just a whole bunch of photons. The energies that the photons get are related to the Higgs boson mass. So this diagram is showing the Higgs boson, and then it's decaying into two photons. Uh, because the Higgs has a certain mass, the energy that the photons is going to carry away is determined by the mass because we have to conserve energy. Right? That's E equals mc squared going backwards this time. Oh, and I should mention, actually, that we have three UCI physics faculty that work on the Atlas experiment. So their job is basically to build that instrument, calibrate it, make it work, and then analyze the data to try to find particles like the Higgs boson. So the challenge is that you can produce those photons in lots of other ways, too. So we don't really know, actually, when we've got a Higgs boson or when we have just other photons that came from some other kind of collision. Uh, so if you don't know the mass, we don't even know what energy you're supposed to be looking for. So what this graphic shows is data from that big detector that we saw. I should have actually told you when I showed it, but it's named as Atlas. Um, I think that a toroidal large something. <laughs> anyway, what we're going to see is as time passes, we're going to count the number of photons we get of each energy. Right? So this will tell us how many photons there are of, of uh, a given energy. And what we're looking for is a bunch of photons that are building up at a certain energy because that's going to tell us where the Higgs boson works. So let's see what they saw when they took data over the last few years. So here it goes. You can see right now, they're not seeing any particular energy is really being favored over the other ones. It's all pretty smooth. You can see there's something happening here in the middle. And now if I trace the data that we collected, what we see is we've got a little bump right here at an energy. So this is uh, 125, and the mass is measured in GeV. So GeV is a funny unit. It basically means that many times the mass of the proton. It's close to that. So basically, by seeing this little bump, what we've seen is what the Higgs boson looks like to an experimentalist who's actually looking for it. 
And of course, you probably heard there was lots of excitement about that. That was a discovery. CERN went wild. Now, the problem with the doing an experiment in Geneva when you live in California is that they report the results when it's 3 a.m. here. So I was awake, connected to my computer, watching this uh, seminar. Uh, you can see this is the point where they actually declared victory. They had all of the results. Uh, this is actually the director of CERN, and I'm not sure what he's doing here, but the picture was so cool. I couldn't do this. Um, and over there, you see Peter Higgs, who's one of the two Nobel laureates this year, uh, last year, uh, for predicting the existence of the Higgs boson in the internet. And this is what a Higgs boson looks like, in case you were wondering. Uh, it turns out you don't need to build a collider. You can actually buy it online for about $15. Uh, and if you want to play this one, I've got one right on. <laughs> so what comes next? Well, the Large Hadron Collider turns on again in about one year. It's going to have twice as much energy as it had before. It's going to produce a lot more collisions. Uh, we've already discovered the Higgs boson, so we don't have to do that anymore. But the point is that since we have this beautiful collider, we should use it to try to produce any other particles that might be out there. And in particular, maybe it's the dark matter that holds our galaxy together. So Professor Bullock just told us about that. And since I was sitting in the audience with my laptop, I could even find a picture of Fritz Wiki showing him what a small spherical basket looks like. <laughs> I guess you can tell. So the real message here is you should stay tuned. The Large Hadron Collider is exciting and Frankly, we don't know what it's going to discover next. Thanks. <laughs> Questions? That's right. So basically, the way you move the protons around is through electromagnetic fields. There's a magnetic field that bends them, and that keeps them going in a circle, and an electric field that gives them a push and makes them go faster. So, and it's pretty amazing, actually, if you think that, you know, these particles are actually very close together, but not close enough that they actually interact. And then at the last minute, when they come to the detector, you give them a little push of the magnetic field, and you actually get them to come together and collide. And there are actually six different points around the ring where that happens. So there's actually six different experiments, and I just showed you one of them. Yeah, so the one year rate is they used to be running at about half the energy, and they needed time basically to get the accelerator ready to run at higher energies. You might have also heard, originally they wanted to just go for growth and start at the high energy to begin with, but there were some problems when they tried to do that. You know, when you're, trying to, when you're building a, a device that no one has ever built before, chances are it doesn't work the first time. In fact, the reason why I'm a theoretical physicist is that it wouldn't work the second time if I did it. It probably wouldn't work the tenth time. So. Um, but what they found is that they were able to make it run at a lower energy, and it worked very fine and stably. And in the meantime, they understood what were the problems with going to the full energy. And so they, they figured out how to solve them while they were taking the original data. And they discovered the Higgs boson, so you know that wasn't so bad. <laughs> uh, and then now they're ready to run at the full energy. Or at least they think. And we'll see what happens in here. That's right. So the size of the circle is controlled by the strength of the magnetic field. The more strong the magnetic field is, the more it will bend. So if you wanted it to bend into a little circle when it's going really fast, when it's going fast, it wants to just keep going straight. So you need a really strong magnetic field to curve it around. And we just can't produce magnetic fields big enough to make this thing small. These are already the mag magnets they're using are actually superconducting magnets. They are cutting edge magnets. You know, you can't really build anywhere else on the earth. So you need to make better magnets. And people are doing research into that to try to make them smaller. Um, but you know, for now, we're stuck with the magnets that we can make. Uh, so um, is there not a technology that is for the future with the focus back to the That's right. Um, can I just, um, are these magnets really valuable? <laughs> um, so some of my colleagues would really love to build a larger one. Uh, it costs a lot of money, and so now there's a discussion going on about whether that's the right thing to do or not. <laughs> and that's right, actually. So uh, one option would be to build a collider that would be about 10 times more energetic, and they're talking about doing that in China. Um, so right now, I don't think you know we know if that's going to happen, but you know I'll be rooting for it if it does.
So three professors, and that's uh, Andrew Langford, Yanda Whiteson, and Agnes Tapper. Uh, then they have a number of students and graduate students usually, and even some undergrads actually, and postdocs that work on it. So all together it's probably more like 10 or 15 people from UCI that work on this experiment. All right. Now, if you use those large ones, uh, much bigger hard collider. The larger hard collider. Larger hard collider. It's very small compared to the magnets we're talking about. Right, maybe one more thing. Do <laughs> uh, you have an hour? <laughs> uh, when we write down the theory that describes all the particles we know about, so that doesn't actually include dark, include dark matter, but all the particles that we know about that make up us and the Earth and stuff, um, we know how to make the theory make sense, but it predicts that all the particles don't have mass. So you need to add something else to the theory to give the particles mass. Otherwise, they'd all be massless, they all travel at the speed of light. Right? And that's not the goal of these two. So the way you do that is by introducing a field that fills all of space and slows the particles down, and it gives them essentially the effect of having mass. This is a way of getting around the fact that the theory didn't want you to just write down the mass to begin with. There are waves that travel through that field, quantum waves, and those look like the Higgs boson particles. So I'm not sure that answer really made that much sense. I'd be happy to talk about it longer when I have more chance. Right, thanks, Greg. I hope you all paid attention to the clip because that will be in the trivia questions. Can we please call up Professor Hamble, please? Of the stars and figure out 
things, but the Greeks really had the simplicity of mind. And on top of that, they tried to develop mathematical models. They were very keen on mathematics, and they on the sphere, circles, particles. So they tried to develop models for how nature works. In fact, the Greeks, on top of that, for example, are known for the name Atom. And it was not Democritus was the first guy that actually thought that if you look at these kind of things, they have some fundamental constituent to that. So they were very good at astronomy. And one of the reasons why they were good at astronomy is that if you have lots of ships and you travel around the Mediterranean, uh, you'll have to find its night. So you can find a way of going the right direction when you cross the Mediterranean. And so they studied the constellations to make sure that at any time of the night, they'd be able to see in what direction they were moving. Now, not only that, but uh, in, uh, say, astronomy or geodesy, you were very able in, uh, in studying what was going on. So one example that I will talk about is Mr. Eratosthenes. So Eratosthenes of Alexandria was, uh, he was the director of the library of Alexandria. And when you're the director, of course, you get a coronal office, so you're not on the third floor. And you look out on the ocean, and he noticed that as the ships in Alexandria, which was in Egypt, was part of Greece, at least it was part of the Ptolemaic Empire at that time, he noticed that as these ships were coming from Greece, he would first see the mast, and then after a while he'd see the rest of the ships. So I said, mm, you know, it just didn't seem to make any difference in what direction they were coming from. So he said, well, maybe there's something to the earth that is not quite flat, as everybody says. And so what he did, he took a grad student and he told him, you know, you walk down by Panama to Siena, which is today basically to Sudan, several hundred miles, you know, 20 days trip on a camel, if the camel is going to go uh, to, to this place, and check on the summer solstice, which is the day, 21st of January, when the sun is way up whether the shadow in the well at Sien is right above uh, the, the bottom of the well, in other words, the sun is right above it. And that was indeed the case, so he told the student, you know, make a note on what day it was. And at the same time, he did the measurements also in Alexandria. In Alexandria, of course, the sun on the 21st of uh, June is not right above it. It's about uh, six degrees off. So, well, the Greeks were good at mathematics, trigonometry, yeah. So we said, well, it looks like there's this angle between the, the two directions of the light in the, in the wells. And uh, so he was able to actually estimate from that, from the distance, from the angle, and from the distance between Alexander and Satan, he was able to establish that the circumference of the Earth is 250,000 stadia. Now, of course, to this day, people debate how much that is because one doesn't have really a clear idea of what a stadium was, right? But under reasonable assumptions, it seems to turn out that it was about 15% off only. So he estimated the circumference of the Earth in about 2000 BC, 200 BC to about 15%, which is remarkable. So he figured out that the Earth was a sphere. Of course, we agreed it was natural that the Earth was a sphere because he Greeks thought in terms of spheres and regular objects and circles, right? And so that was an amazing achievement of, uh, of uh, Greek uh, science and Greek physics. Not only that, but there was another very clever guy by the name of Aristarchus of Samos. And Aristarchus of Samos looked out the window and he looked at the moon and he looked at the sun occasionally as you know, and he noticed by some details that I won't go into, that uh, there are certain angles that are evolved when, when you have a half moon and you have a sun shines, it shines on the half moon, and that those angles would be sufficient, they could measure them sufficiently accurate that he could first establish the size of the moon, secondly establish the distance between us and the moon to a few percent, and third, that he could estimate the distance between us and the sun which he got, uh, well, he got wrong by a factor of 20, so he was not that close. It turns out the sun is a lot further than what he thought. And he, est he estimated the sun is 20 times further than the moon. It's more like 400 times. So I guess he couldn't believe that it was so far away, but uh, nevertheless, he established that there was this hierarchy, this relationship 
Not only that, but uh, to him it was obvious that the sun was at the center. Everything was revolving around the sun. We were revolving around the sun, and the moon is revolving around us. So that's why Aristarchus of Samos is sometimes referred to as the ancient Copernicus, because he basically figured out the Copernican heliocentric system. And uh, well, interestingly enough, most of his work is lost. Most of what we know is told by Archimedes, whose own work is partly lost, but Archimedes describes the theory. And uh, well, then the Romans came along and they wiped most of that out, and we ended up with the Ptolemaic system where planets go around the world, circles around the circles, which is called the Instant Theory. But then eventually it was revived in the 16th, 15th century by Copernicus. So that is to tell you how clever the Greeks were. They really uh, not just invented physics by doing a few things here and there, by really uh, answered certain deep questions and were able really to get the bottom of it by unprejudicial kind of inquiries. So the Greeks were good physicists. You want to see something cool? I can make this olive go into this glass without touching it. Swing it around, 
And by swinging it around, you create that position of gravity. And uh, so that would seem to be useful, right? And uh, so then we may be able to play whether we should call it centripetal force, which means a force that is pushing the object towards the center, namely the, the walls, in this case, the plastic walls are pushing the ball in. Or whether you can call it, call it centrifugal, which is a tendency of an object to move away from the center towards the walls. And of course, this in the end turns out to be a, a semantic or just a word issue because it ties in with the fact that uh, Einstein has demonstrated that there is actually no way of telling one from the other. That is, if you take uh, that rotating bucket or if you take a spaceship and you rotate it so that you create a position of gravity, by the rotation, this gravity that you create is absolutely identical to the gravity that you have on Earth from the gravitational field. So Einstein built his theory of relativity on the so-called principle of equivalence between gravitational and inertial mass. And therefore, if you do an experiment out in space where the spacecraft is rotating, that experiment would have no way whatsoever of telling, except looking outside, if you're assuming that you're in some sort of a black box, of telling whether there is actually a gravitational field or not. And uh, so that is a deep, very deep issue. And uh, Newton already confronted that issue many centuries ago because he said, well, how do you tell then in the end if something is rotating or not, right? Because at first it would seem obvious that, uh, well, you're rotating in one case, you're not very good at rotating in the other case, and what's the difference? Well, Newton's answer was that there is absolute space. There's absolute space out there, right? This ether, and if you're rotating with respect to the ether, then you generate a centrifugal or centrifugal force. If you're not rotating, then there is no force. Well, this notion of absolute space uh, was intensely disliked by physicists in the 19th century who thought that it was just metaphysics and was something that had no place in physics. So a very brilliant uh, Austrian physicist said, no, 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 this is all nonsense. He, he created what was called the Mach principle and he said, the reason why when you spin you get pulled out and there's this artificial gravity is because you're rotating with respect to the rest of the universe. You're rotating with respect to the faraway galaxies, which provide a preferred frame, and that is the reason why uh, there is this distinction. That's why you have this effect. And well, that is known as Max principle. And so Max principle postulates that the origin of inertia, the reason why the body resists acceleration, that origin of inertia is presumably related to the distribution of mass in the whole universe, including the most parallel galaxies we can see. And uh, so that origin of inertia, in a sense, is one of the great mysteries to this day. It was one of the subjects of uh, uh, research, which are things that I'm interested in, the origin of gravity. So we still, to this day, don't know why when you accelerate a body, it resists. It's called inertia. And as Feynman used to say in one of his lectures, nobody knows it. Thank you. Questions? Hey, let's try this one. Spherical Heckel function. Hold on. That's it. That's it. That's Eureka. <laughs> hey, when you gave me this Eureka test, we wanted to say it together. <laughs> Let's say it together. No, the boat is lost. <laughs> Greetings, gentlemen. How about your little project? You mean project that ended what, buddy? <laughs> oh, a combination of all your names. Very clever. I assume Kuthra and Arduins was taken. <laughs> Actually scanning equations and getting good results. Oh, well then by all means, carry on. I wouldn't want to impede your progress. Uh, did you solve the install time problem yet? No, it's a little tricky. I'm going to try having it pick up a little. <laughs> what are you doing, baby? Playing the theremin. <laughs> what are you doing with a the theremin? 
Find it. I loved the theremin from the first moment I heard the original Star Trek theme. And it's been killing me that it just sits in my closet gathering dust. on a very simple principle, which is to have two resonating or near resonating dust suit circuits. So a circuit is composed with a simple uh, like a capacitor and inductor, and there is two of them, and they tune the two frequencies which are very close to each other, and one of the two is connected to an antenna. So anytime you come close to it, you're slightly varying the capacitance of one of the two circuits, and that allows you to uh, make different noises, pick the circuit frequency. And uh, so the point of this instrument is that you can play, play in principle, without touching anything. That is, just by uh, usually the zero is about 20 centimeters or so from the antenna. And then just by moving your hand closer to it, you can go for a whole lot there. Now, of course, clumsy hand like mine uh, is not able to actually get the notes correctly. I mean, it's a little bit like the violin, where you have to know exactly where the position of your fingers are supposed to be on the string. Here, uh, you're just uh, moving your hands in the air, so finding the right uh, spot is, is kind of difficult. Uh, but, uh, you know, I usually you can find a YouTube video where somebody has a contraption like that and plays a whole symphony on it. But, uh, but there are people that uh, are skilled at doing it. it. Now, one amazing thing about this is actually it's sensitive to temperature and the humidity. In other words, the the guy that actually put something like this together to help us in a heavy Japanese accent that you have to have the thing sit still for about three or four minutes so that it adapts to the humidity of the room. Because otherwise, the frequencies shift and it actually gets out of tune. So tuning this thing is, is, is very difficult. It requires really a lot of patience. But nevertheless, this was invented by a Russian guy by the name of Fermi. Twenties, and I understand. I, I mean, I knew very little about this thing a few days ago. That the RCA in the 1920s actually made a device like this, and there were sufficient number of tools that actually bought it. So uh, it became a popular instrument, and you can see how well it actually works. And, uh, so it's an interesting device, and it might uh, show some features of it. Uh, 
um, electric fields. I mean, I really don't want to go into it, but it's just not the kind of stuff that we want this happen. So it's like charging and stuff like that. And charging when you can, and you just change the capacity of some equipment or something. So it's a very simple uh, electronic device. Yes. Thank all the professors for coming here today. Professor Humber, Professor Tate, and I lost Professor Bullock. I think he left, but thank you so much. We really enjoyed it. It was great. So one more round of applause, please. <laughs> and before we get into our trivia game, our VP Skyla has just one announcement to make. Hello everyone, I hope all of you had a lot of you know, fun experiences with all the school demonstrations and all the lessons that you learned from our wonderful faculty throughout campus and 
you know, for myself, who had barely, you know, distinguished PH and PhD, I certainly learned a lot tonight. So thank you so much. Hopefully we can, you know, kind of see the show from now on with a brand new perspective. And I would like to kind of introduce one of the upcoming ASUCA events, which we're very excited. It's Cal Penn, who has watched the Power of Kumar before. Many of you, right? So yes, so he played Kumar Patel. And we cannot be more excited to actually have him on campus to speak. Uh, for himself, if you don't know his personal story, he graduated from the CLA, and he actually served under Obama last administration as the associate director for public engagement. And this term, he currently serves as our community director. So himself is very politically involved, being all the White House and the very politics, and also our education, as he is a strong advocate for you know equal rights and then definitely fight for the quality education that all the students do deserve. So for the speaking engagement, we really welcome him to come here to be able to resonate with all of you, you know, in terms of his roles in many uh, popular movies and the kind of shows, but also to be able to kind of encourage all the students to get more engaged in politics and perhaps to also fight for higher education later on. Um, so yeah, so the events will be on March 5th, so that's about a week and a half from now at 7 p.m. at the City Ballrooms. And starting tomorrow, we'll be selling tickets at the ASUCI uh, office, which is right across the ATM, Student Government Student Media. So you'll be able to purchase your ticket, which is $5 for all the undergraduates uh, and graduate students, and then $10 for ACI affiliates. So you can also purchase guest tickets for whoever that's you know, not currently a student. Um, so yeah, so definitely encourage all of you to come. It should be a really fun event. There will also be chances for you to actually have uh, me and Reed afterwards with him, so you'll be able to go to a friendly room and then kind of talk and chat with him. So yeah, so feel free to visit the uh, ASCCI website if you need any more information, and then all the topics on email will be sent out tomorrow, and then we'll see a lot more about the city for the upcoming week. All right, thank you all so much, and then we're going to jump into the trivia game. Thank you, Skyla. Okay, so for the first question, we're going to go all the way back to season one. When Penny and Leonard were first meeting, she asked Leonard if he could go retrieve something for her from her ex-boyfriend. Of course, Sheldon helped. So who knows what that item was that she asked? The hand all the way in the back was the person that I saw go up. <laughs> yeah, that is correct. And Jill or Skyla will actually deliver your prize, which is the calendar. Yeah. Okay. So the second question that I have is: In one of the episodes, there was a trading card competition, in which Will Wheaton actually was playing a big role. His partner was Stuart. Now, who was Sheldon's partner? Um, the guy in the gray sweatshirt. Yes, you. <laughs> Raj, that is correct. And now Dill will give you the poster. Actually, no, Skyla. All right. Third question goes back to Professor Tate's um, presentation with the Collider. So Leonard was really excited on Valentine's Day that he was going to take Penny to Switzerland. But that really didn't go that well. So who did he end up taking to Switzerland? And I saw the maroon sweater go up first. Okay. Yes. False. <laughs> okay, the woman with the scarf. Yes. That's, yes, that is correct. So you will get a nun. And the last question is, what is Penny's last name? <laughs> Um, there's a girl in the back with a uh, teal shirt and a black sweater. That is correct. All right. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you all have a safe trip back home, and we'll see you at Cal's Thank you.